we're in the uh, second bracha, and we say, Mechalka Chaim Bechesed, Mechaim Esim Rachmim Rabim. God sustains life with Chesed. This is indiscriminate kindness, and He res resurrects the dead with great mercy. And then the, we get into the details between life and ultimately the resurrection. What does he do in the interim in regard to the human being? In what context are we beneficiaries of God's accommodation? He supports the fallen, heals the sick, frees the imprisoned, which we discussed. And ultimately, he fulfills his, what he had promised to those who were sleeping in the, in the dust or in the earth. So I was thinking, you know, the last part of the Amida is modim. We give thanks for all that God had done for us. And in the modim, the first thing we say we thank you, God, Shatohu Hashem Elokeinu. That's the first thank you. That you're our God, meaning, I mean, God is the God of all mankind, meaning we have this personalization and you take a personal interest in us and whatever you do for us, it's only, even if we don't understand, as we say that even God forbid, a Jew experiences tragedy, we acknowledge it, with the blessing, and the blessing is Dino Emes. God is the true judge. Although we don't understand, and we see that maybe it's beyond the pale in terms of what we're deserving, we say no. We accept it as absolute truth, as we don't understand. And the example is, a doctor gives a diagnosis that a person has a very serious illness, and the only way to deal with it, you have to take the most extreme measures. And the person doesn't understand the nature of the illness or the disease. He says, but why do you have to be so extreme? Why can't you take just an antibiotic? Why can't that arrest the problem? So the doctors, because if you understand the nature of the illness or the disease, you can say antibiotics not enough here. You need something beyond it. And although it's painful, there was suffering, you become incapacitated for a certain period of time or even permanently. If you want to remain alive, this is the only way to go. Hashem is dino emes. Any experience in life that we experience, the most painful, the most tragic, the only reason why we see it as that, it is only because we don't understand the nature of the necessity of what God is doing for us. But if we don't understand the only way we are able to merit the ultimate eternity and something, there's nothing compared to what that is, we would be appreciative. It's like the doctor, the surgeon, excising a tumor and extending the person's life for another 50 years in good health, that she be fully functional. First we say, we give thanks to God that you're our God, that you took us as your people. Although you're the creator, although you're the infinite being, you, the omnipotent one, the infinite creator, you took us as your people. This is something, there's nothing compared to. As much as we speak and give thanks unceasingly, we give thanks, we acknowledge that. Then we continue and we speak on a more personal level in terms of what we could appreciate. When a person sleeps, the Talmud tells us sleep is one sixtieth of death. That when a person sleeps, part of the soul ascends to heaven and it's reinvigorated. And that's why we say in the morning, God gives power to what? To the one who's weary, who's, who's, who's tired. Every night there's a re-infusion, a revitalization to give us the ability to continue and to, not only, and to be alive. He returns our souls. 
person, God forbid, goes to sleep, people don't wake up. Do we have even appreciation? In the morning we say, We say every morning, We give thanks to you. You return my soul. That acknowledgement. Who acknowledges it? You go to sleep, you're healthy. When you go to sleep, you know, you don't worry that you're not waking up. It's it's an assumption. It's a given. But yet, although it's a given, and we are not sufficiently appreciated for it, we acknowledge it with this statement. We give thanks to you. The king, the eternal king, eternal. You turn my soul with mercy. Although even when we say to Modani, do we feel appreciative? Person gives you, saves your life, and you appreciate he saved your life. You you internalize emotionally, mentally. You're totally consumed with what? With thankfulness to that person. He saved your life. Every single day, God returns our soul to us. When a person, and that's why when we awaken in the morning, we have to ritualize our hands in a certain way because there is a contaminated spirit on their hands and it can only be removed if you wash your hands in a certain way. Each hand has to have water poured on three times in each hand. Can, there's a question, can, alternately or even one after another in each hand, that's sufficiently. But nevertheless, what is the contaminated spirit on the hands? There's a residue this is a result of the person being not fully alive. You so part of the soul has been taken, it's returned. We're a new human being. In the morning, one of the blessings we say, God returns the souls to bodies that are not alive. That's a blessing we say every morning. You created it, you formed it. You put it, gave it to me, you put it into me. Ultimately, you're going to take that soul for us. A person doesn't live forever. And then you're going to return that soul. And what do we conclude? God returns the soul to the corpses, the bodies that are truly dead. When we sleep, we're partially not alive. This is what we say in the modem, our souls that are given to you for safekeeping. The, the, the miracles, the wonders, every day we experience wonders and miracles. Every moment, you tell me, you ask anybody, when was the last time you experienced the miracle? Person says, yeah, I went, 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 went ski, snowboarding up in Vermont. I came down the mountain and I somebody bumped into me. I was unconscious and I, and I regained consciousness. That's a miracle. Okay. Could have been God forbid killed, especially if you're a doctor, you appreciate that. It's a miracle. But how many people experience miracles? But we say in the Modim, every day we experience miracles and wonders and we're giving thanks for those. You ask anybody, when was the last time you experienced a miracle? What are the miracles? So I was thinking many things, but when you say, the beginning of the Amida, we begin with life and we conclude with resurrection. And then we start filling in the gaps. So supports the falling, heals the sick, what do we say? And then we'll articulate and delineate how he indiscriminately sustains life. That will speak. Ultimately, he resurrects the dead. So we explained that the ult ultimate objective in life is ultimately the big payoff, the great reward. That not only is the soul rewarded for its choice which is a proper choice, the body being a partner in that decision, in partnering and actualizing 
the will of Hashem, it also has to be rewarded. The ultimate reward is what is resurrection, where God reinfuses the soul into that body. But nobody's perfect, as we explained. Initially, God wanted to create the world with the attribute of justice, which is precision. But God understood man will not survive it. Because man is pro to feel if God would institute the attribute of justice, man would not live beyond a very short period of time. Person would be immediately incapacitated, would become non-functional. But God doesn't want that. God wants to offer every opportunity for the human being to try to succeed as much as he can. He'll delay, he'll hold the, the execution at bay. He may even annul the decree. May does, he does many things to give the human being the ultimate opportunity to maximize on his life. How does he do this? Why should a person fall? A person is undeserving. Why should he fall on his face? Why should he break his leg, break his arm? Why should he have even sustain uh, a slight degree of pain? The answer is because nobody's perfect. But if you're not perfect, and to be the attribute of justice, you couldn't survive. This is only an indication of what, that there's some shortcoming in the system. And this is like a person has a fever, it's an indication that health-wise there's a problem. Fever is an indicator. Person falls and he's injured or hurt, or something maybe a slight something, it's an indication. But, but that's something, why doesn't somehow rain in on the person? The answer is, that's God's indiscriminate kindness. Because if that, if, because if he would rein in, and he would not support the falling, fallen, and he would not heal the sick, and he would not free the imprisoned, we'd never make it to the goalpost. Never. So to facilitate that a person should be worthy of resurrection, he institutes indiscriminate kindness to be able to arrive where we, he wants us to arrive, to give us the greatest opportunity, the greatest chance to be able to achieve that. Now you understand when we say, Modim, give thanks to you. You've kept our souls for safekeeping when we sleep, or even after we die to return them at time of resurrection. The miracles and the wonders every day. It's miracles. Could you imagine a person takes cyanide? He should die instantaneously. And somebody immediately, before not allowing a nanosecond to pass, he injects him with a neutralizer that neutralizes that cyanide, that holds it at bay, that the person shouldn't ex expire instantaneously. It's a, mir it's a miracle. Or the person wanted to take his life off a bit, he took the wrong pill. He took a vitamin rather than something that would have taken his life. It's a, mir a miracle. Why did he make the mistake? Because God wanted him to be alive. These are miracles. We have enough claim against us, we should not be able to survive beyond three steps. This is Modem Anachuloch Hashem, we give thanks to you. Firstly, that you're a God, that you chose us to be your people. This is something, a privilege, which is un unexpressible. The creator himself chose us to be, to be his people. The so our souls that you keep for safekeeping and every day you return them. And we acknowledge it every morning. The miracles and the wonders. You know what those miracles want? This is Somech no flim. God supports the fallen. But what does he have to support you? There's no reason to fall. There's plenty of reason to fall. As King Solomon says, There's no perfect tzaddik. So even for the slightest imperfection, we should fall. We find that Yaakov, you know, he hadn't seen his brother for 35, nearly 35 years. Although God gave him every guarantee that he'll be protected. Yet Yaakov questioned whether he was worthy of that protection. Why? Because maybe I became soiled with sin. Yaakov, the most perfect of the patriarchs, the patriarch that fathered the 12 tribes, he's concerned that even though God gave him a guarantee that he'll return whole, physically and spiritually, he's concerned 
his brother may actually take his life. Maybe I became soiled with sin. And therefore, I'm no worthy of that original guarantee. It's like a person has a warranty. And you abuse the product, the warranty is not in effect any longer. Yaakov felt maybe he's not worthy any longer. So how do we survive? How do we make it to the goalpost? How do we achieve the objective of creation, which is ultimately is the physical, spiritual, to be able to bask in God's glory, which is the ultimate good. This is the miracles and the wonders which God provides us. We're not even aware of, not aware of. Person's not well, he recovers. Why did you recover? Well, you know, you had a good doctor. Thank God today with medicine where it's at, we're able to deal with all these issues. But the people don't recover. And why did Hashem allow all these new medical procedures to be discovered and the pharmaceuticals, that they have drugs that can deal with all these issues. The vaccine, you know, if you believe the vaccine is what makes the difference, that ended the pandemic. If you believe that, some people don't. But if you believe that, if they wouldn't have come up with this, who did say, so, you know, if not for Trump, and even the others that he really expedited it and he overrode many FDA, whatever it is, valuations and approvals, we wouldn't have it. Endless more people would have died. Of course, you have to be appreciative to any human being who, that if you're a beneficiary of that person's service or actions, but ultimately you can't provide the solution if it doesn't exist as much as you want to provide the solution. So does anybody say, we thank God that we're alive? When you say, Rufainu Hashem v'nei rofei, the brach of healing, you heal us and the healing is permanent. It's not a temporary healing. Who do you give thanks to? Do we acknowledge that God, is, but why did God allow it? Why? The answer is because there's reason to remain alive. And if you wouldn't provide that solution, you wouldn't be alive. But he wants to be alive. But you're not worthy to be alive. Despite our lack of worthiness, he still provides, and this is what we're saying, he sustains life indiscriminately with indiscriminate kindness. And how does he do that? He supports the fallen, he heals the sick, and he rele releases the imprisoned. These are the miracles that we're giving modem for at the end. Not only does he do it, and can he do it, we are beneficiaries of that. And every human being is a beneficiary of that. The poorest person who didn't have a good day in his life, actually, whatever he has, he wants to have, even at the most minimal level. Nobody wants to die. That that you're alive and you don't want to die and God is allowing you to live, these are miracles, these are wonders. These are all, this is the goodness that God provides. Hatov ki lo We say, Hatov, you are good, that your mercy does not cease to be. It's unceasing. You know, it's interesting. We've taken many things for granted. But if you ever experience a blackout with the electricity shuts off, you have, it shuts off for a minute, okay? Comes back, you, you don't feel the consequence. Electricity goes out in the summer for five hours where it becomes stifling and the air is difficult even to breathe and everything's like stagnates. You, 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 like you feel you're in a torture chamber after a while. And what about if you have, it goes on for a few days and there's no electricity and therefore there's no heat and it's the winter and many other things. So that, that the energy flows continuously and we don't feel the effect of not having the energy. Do we appreciate it? The system could shut down anytime, it can malfunction. The system could be overloaded in the summer because of whatever overuse. And all of a sudden, the whole system goes down. Everybody's calling frantically, what happened? The food's gonna spoil in, in the freezer, in the refrigerator. We have all kinds of warnings, don't open the refrigerator for the next 25 hours. Of course, it's good for the next three days. If you don't, what, what, what do we eat? You know, again, 
There's so many amenities of life which could happen, which could be taken from us, which would make life literally impossible, especially once we become acclimated to a certain level of comfort and givens. But that itself is within the realm of natural. If the system is not abused and this and that, the systems work. But in terms of ourselves, the amount of baggage we have, the amount of reason why our immune system should fail, we have an immune system. If not for the immune system, we'd be subject to every level, God forbid, of all kinds of attacks on our health. What's the value of skin? God coated the body with skin. It's protective armor to skin. The skin itself is the largest organ that exists in, in, in the body that protects us. Once the skin is breached, you're susceptible for, back, for infection. That's why God forbid you, know, you have burn units. Once that, that person is open for all kinds of infection, endless infections. Person, God forbid, has to be under the chemotherapy. And as a result of that, the immune system is compromised. The person is open for things not to be believed, things which are given all our lives. You're not, if you're healthy, you're not susceptible to those things. But we have enough reason that our immune system should have been breached endless times over. And we should be. So who, keep, who maintains that? On the Sechashim I wonder the miracles and wonders which are continuous. We're under attack. We don't even realize to what degree we're under attack. You know, the uh, Talmud, the Gemara in Brocha speaks about demons. Demons. And that you're not permitted to put yourself in a position where exposed to these nether forces because actually you put your life's in jeopardy. And you're not permitted to do it. But these demons, it, the Gemara gives you a prescription. If you want to see what a demon looks like, gives you, it tells you how to do it. And it says, one or more, one of the great rabbis of the Talmud, he wanted to see what a demon looks like. You have to take a, whatever's a black cat, the percent of black cat, that's, that's the daughter of a black cat, a whole, whole, how to do it, burn it, put the ash on the eyes, and then you'll be able to see demons. That's the prescription. I want to try to follow. So it says this great rabbi did it and he saw the demons and when he saw them, he lost his mind. It was so terrifying and tra tra traumatizing, he went off his mind and his colleagues, his peers had to pray for his recovery. Otherwise he wouldn't have come back. So the Gemara says, the Talmud says, animals visually see demons. A human being cannot see demons only if he put himself in that setting of, of danger. Why? Because an animal has no intelligence. So when it sees the demon, it doesn't affect it. But a human being that's an intelligent being, if we would see demons, we could not function. Could you imagine if a person would have microscopic vision and you'd walk and you'd see, you know, it's like a person's floaters in his eye. Floaters, you know, people have experience with detached retinas. You know, some, some people have this in their back and their medical background. But a person has floaters when he gets older and you're looking and you see things floating before your eye. Eventually it, it interferes with your eyesight. You can see seeing floaters. I know a person, he was a doctor, he was an astrologist and he had to claim disability because he had serious floaters. He couldn't read the x-rays when he put them up on the, on the x-ray, on the light, they couldn't see it. The floaters were interfering. Couldn't get an accurate, visually wasn't accurate any longer. Could you imagine if we'd see all the bacteria and everything floating before our eyes? You couldn't function. But now I'm talking about demons. Every aspect of our being, that we don't have that acuity of vision, like microscopic vision. It's a brocha. It's a blessing. Because if we would have greater ability, we couldn't function. Because of the level of who we are, what we are, or how to be effective and be productive in our lives. God's kindness is indiscriminate, unending. He brings back 
the dead, resurrects dead with great mercy, as we explained, not ordinary mercy, great. Because you've been here, if you don't make the grade, it's not so simple, you come back. But because of Hashem's abundant mercy, overwhelming mercy, even though a person would you believe would have not the right to come back, God ultimately wants, if a person has any degree of worthiness, to be a beneficiary of that ultimate goodness, which is to be able to be, at some level, exposed to who he is. Who he is the source of the good in its absolute context. But as I said, but how do you get there? So mech noflim. Continuous. Could you imagine a person has, a, a, he needs a brace to walk. Without the brace, he can't walk. And the brace itself has a, a motorized something in it to allow the person to walk. And if that energy in that motorized prosthesis should fail, can't walk. So many chlofim is continuous. It's not he's catching us not to fall on our face. It's continuous. It's not once in a while he supports the fallen. Person has to fall in, fall on his face and fracture every bone in his face to have reconstructive surgery. You don't need that. He's continuously so much no flame. Continuously he's healing. He's shoring up that immune system of yours, fortifying your whatever it is, your blood, red, bl- red blood cells, whatever it is, whatever you need to maintain yourself. It's continuous. You're always in a state of temptation. He's always, and we're surrounded by it. And yet, he's material surim. He releases you from that temptation. He allows you to take charge of your life. Because the person's out of control, you have no, you can't be a functional person. You know, there's a term used in, in, in halachic context. It's called shoter. Shoter. A shoter means a person, the way it, it was always explained in the olden days, was an imbecile or retarded person. It's not a shoter. Because a shoter, that classification of person is considered incompetent and he has no level of liability for his response, for, for, his, for his behavior. Because he's considered incompetent. What's a shoter? A shoter is a person who's called unstable. He could have a 300 IQ, but if he has no control over his behavior, he has no, there's no accountability for that person because he can't, can't control himself. You can't fault him for not being able to control himself. But he understands better. He may understand better, but he has no control. So therefore, a shoter is a person who's unstable. That's what it is. So let's say we have people, you know, we don't appreciate what it means. God forbid a person's bipolar. If he doesn't take his medication, he could be a raging madman, raging, literally, without that medication. A person has no chemical imbalance. Thank God a person is blessed. His balance is, is within the realm of normalcy. You could be a productive human being. You could be a pleasant human being. You could be an effective human being. Who appreciates this? But there's a certain percentage of the population who have chemical imbalances. A person has a few children. One of the children have this all these different classifications. ADD, DDA, whatever they are, these things. Well, you need Ritalin. But Ritalin has its side effects. Your other few children don't. This The child is unbelievable. You have to take them to the doctor, from formal psychiatrist, continues. It consumes your life. Do we appreciate that you have a normal child? He's not the potential Nobel Prize winner, but he's a normal, healthy child and will function as a responsible human being. Nothing more than that. But he didn't get into Harvard. He only got into Brooklyn Law School, not into Harvard Law. You're disappointed, you know something. Thank God, be appreciative. Even if he would have just graduated high school and been a responsible, honest human being and a Jew, believing Jew, and making the grade, you should count your blessings endless times over. In addition, you even sing God's praises beyond that. But again, everything's miracles. And we give thanks every day for the miracles continuously and wonders which he performs on our behalf. Only because 
He's a, first, he's Hashem Elokeinu. We give thanks that you're our God. You chose us and you take care of us and you're concerned about us like no one else because we are your children. And not only are your children, Moshe Rabbeinu depicts us as B'ni B'chori Yisrael. It's like a firstborn. As a firstborn, is the most beloved to, its, to the father. The love that God has for the Jewish people is like a firstborn. As many Jews as they are were first, his firstborn. Last night, there was a certain thing on, what, it, was, it wasn't a documentary, this Jew from Chicago, his parents came from a certain town in Poland. And the majority of the town was sent to the gas chamber. And he wanted to go back to that town to seek, to get some information about that town. And there was a Polish child he was two years old when the war broke out and his parents had given him over to an orphanage a catholic orphanage for three years he really he remembered so after the war he still knew he was a jew he was old enough to remember but he knew nothing but he knew he was a jew and somehow this jew in in, in chicago and today this person when they were in touch he must have been already a man in his 50s and he spoke english Baby came to the United States, but he knew very little about Judaism. And somehow they connected and he went back to this town and they did a documentary on it. And they, that was called Shtetl. It was done secondly, Shtetl. Spent about 20 minutes watching it last night. And it was late, very late at night, it must've been about one in the morning. And, um, so um, the question is, they interviewed the, the Poles who live in town, all the houses were mostly Jewish houses. And within one day, there were two and a half thousand Jews in this town. Within hours, there wasn't one Jew left in town. Immediately, everything was taken over by the locals. So they wanted to know, they were interviewed them, the people, and there were some old people there who remembered the Holocaust and how they went and hunted the Jews in the forests and mass graves. And there was a certain young young Pole, he's only maybe 40 years old. His life's mission is to reveal all that the atrocities, what happened and bring out and to show that it was a Jewish community thriving, they were good people, so on and so forth. And they contacted this person. So they wanted to know you know, what exactly, why didn't they harbor the Jews to protect him? So they said, because they were, it was a threat of their own families, that if they'd be caught harboring a Jew, they would kill their families and kill them, so on and so forth. But then they said, there's one, there were two brothers, their name was Rich, the family name was Rich, although Rich could be a Jewish name. They went and they themselves, these Jews, some of them were wealthy. They went and took these Jews and they smashed their heads here, they didn't even give up the journey, and they took all their wealth. Bloodthirsty murderers. They took their wealth without any conscience. And one of the brothers is still alive. And these two, this Jew with this other Jew, this Pole, who was his, his translator, goes and they interview this, this Pole. Must be a man in his 90s. This person, this rich, the brother, surviving brother, and they start asking questions. And you can see clearly, the man himself, you could see he's lying through his teeth because the way he answers the question, it's like, it's not slowly. It's like he wants to dismiss it. And he himself with his own hands murdered Jews to take their wealth, you understand? And I look at this, this human being here, this, 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 this monster, innocent men, men, women, and children, he murdered them for the sake of their wealth. So at the end, the question was, they asked these people, if this scenario would repeat itself, would you do the same thing over again? To protect your lives, would you harbor them? Would you inform to save your lives, even if you don't actually kill them? Would you do it over again? Stone silence, they did not respond. That was the, the punchline, they didn't respond. So you tell me, 
How much protection do we need? Now in the United States, anti-Semitism is rearing its head. There's a statistic this year, anti-Semitism in the United States is up 300%. 300% in one year. And every day you hear stories. I went to a, a Sheva Brothers Friday night. We came back 1030. So somebody says to me, uh, be safe and get home safely. We talk about a neighborhood. It's a safe neighborhood. But there have been incidences recently where people came from outside the neighborhood and people were hurt or people were mugged or people were actually, th their lives were threatened. Things which were, are unheard of in the United States, especially safe neighborhoods. You can't take anything for granted. You can't become paranoid, but to be appreciative. So what level of protection do you need? The miracles which God continues to provide for all the years we were safe. You don't think people had anti-Semitism in their hearts, but they wouldn't dare act on whatever those feelings were, or they didn't allow them. They were so suppressed because the law didn't allow it. Who didn't allow it? God didn't allow it. Because the government was a government which actually, there were consequences. It wasn't just laws on the book. There was law and order. You should pray for welfare of government because if not, man would swallow one up another alive. That is the nature of a human being. They, they become worse than, than predators. So when we speak about what does God do continuously, sustains life indiscriminately, resurrects the dead, but how do you do that? How do you bring that about? Life's a continuum. How do you arrive at that goalpost? So mech no flim, rofecho, matira surim. But how does that manifest itself? When we say the modim and we articulate, al nisecho shemchol yimano, val nifosecho shemchol yomimano, the wonders, the miracles, which are continuous, and they're unceasing, because we conclude, hatov kilo cholor achmecho, your goodness doesn't stop there's no end to it. It's unending because it wouldn't be unending. God forbid, we wouldn't make it to the goalpost. You know, it's interesting. You know, young people. You have a young person, could be phenomenally precocious and intelligent, but the experience of life doesn't allow the younger person to be really in touch with the reality of what's out there. And that person may believe that because he has great potential and capability, there's no challenge that he can't meet and succeed. Only through life do you realize life's far from perfect. As much as you think you could succeed, it doesn't always work, or maybe many times it doesn't work. There's always slippage. There's always disappointment. There's always failure. There's always many things. And that, but again, when you, reach a certain level of maturity and experience in life, you realize that that is the reality. There's certain things we don't even realize. And that's what we're articulating over here. And that's what we give thanks for. The ongoing miracles and wonders. If not for them, you know, it's interesting. They say medically that there's certain cells in the body, cancer cells or whatever, they're always there. But there's certain things which actually have to activate that to manifest itself, that it start festering and become something, God forbid, that it becomes full blown or it has to be attended to, whatever it is. What's the activator? What causes it? So it'll come out, well, it's stress, it's this, that many people are stressful and they don't come down with that disease or other situations. Well, it's in the genes. You know, there's always an answer. If there wouldn't be an answer, everybody would be at Sadiq. It's always because you contribute to something else, therefore there's always an answer. But a Jew, when he stands and he has the audience with Hashem, and you say, who are you? What do you do? Sustain life indiscriminately. Ultimately, to resurrect the dead. But in the interim, to be able to achieve that, without that, it's not happening. Therefore, let's talk. When we go to the supplication blessings and we ask for things, we've already said he's that because we take things for granted. Therefore, he has to continuously fuel the system because there's enough claims against us or there's enough foreign substances in our systems 
that we shouldn't survive. Therefore, we say, God forbid a person could have an aneurysm. He could have a blood clot. He could start suffering from dementia. He could have Alzheimer's. He could have a head injury. Endless things. You ever see pictures of, of uh, Cassius Clay? You know, they used to say a boxer became punch drunk. He was hit so many times in the head, they didn't realize it caused brain injury. By the time he was, I don't know what, what age he was, the man already, he didn't even know who he was. He, he, he was brain damaged. But continuously, a person falls. He only ras- he, he injured his head. He had a concussion. But he recovered. Could have been more serious. The concussions could have had permanent damage. Endless, endless things. And this is all what we call chesed elion. This is divine, indiscriminate kindness. Because again, as I say, you know, there was a story many years ago. There was a student, he was 18, 19 years old. He came from Detroit. And his father was a Holocaust survivor. And he was the richest observant Jew in Detroit. He owned shopping centers. And he was, he was like the carpet king of Detroit. And in the 60s, he was worth already $40 million, this person, which was a lot of money. And one day, it was right before Schwartz, it was right after Schwartz, he gets a phone call. His father died of a heart attack. He's 19 years old. He has to come back, run the business. This young boy didn't know very much about running a business, especially this is, this is not a simple business. So he said over his father's eulogy, his father, most of his family, were killed, perished in the Holocaust. And his father always said, why did God allow me to survive? Why? Was I more righteous than the others? He says, definitely not. Holier, more righteous people, more innocent people perished. Why did I survive? His father would say, the reason why I survived is because evidently God has a plan for me. I have a purpose. It has nothing to do with my worthiness. I have my place in the future that I have to be effective in whatever, I don't know exactly where, how, when, but opportunity will be presented to me, whatever that may be, and I have to be effective in that context. That's what God allowed me to survive. So he became a very wealthy man. He became an observant person. He was a, a very serious philanthropist. He supported all the Jewish institutions, and he built institutions there and supported Torah and other things. Evidently, that was his purpose. God said, had nothing with his worthiness. It's ultimately, what, a, what is the objective of your life? What is the value? As we said, every soul has a unique mission. We don't know exactly what our particular mission may be. One thing we know, every Jew has a baseline mission to, to maintain his soul, which is the 613 dictates of the Torah. 248 positive commandments, 365 ne- negative commandments. That is a baseline. What is your expertise? What do you have to focus on? What do you have to become outstanding in? Or what, where, where, what is your exact place? Hopefully, life will tell that. Hopefully, we'll have that level of clarity to maximize on that opportunity to address our potential. But you can't even consider that. So therefore, you say, well, everybody has cancer cells. So why was this person, his cells were activated and it manifests itself in a mass and the person didn't live more than six months after it was discovered. And this other person, despite many things, he's still functioning, still effective. Because he has a different objective. But for, to meet that objective, you have to have endless miracles. He has to support the, the fallen. He has to heal the sick. And he has to do whatever he has, he has to do. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So what we're articulating now in the opening, it's not a supplication. It's not thanks, but when we give thanks, in retrospect, we have an understanding and appreciation for what we're saying at this moment over here. So that's a somich nofnim rofi cholim umatir asurim, and he releases the what the imprisoned. It says he fulfills his faithful word to those sleeping in the dust. How do we know? He will, he, it will fulfill his word. It hasn't happened yet. 
How do you know we fulfill this word? It's our belief. If you believe in God and you believe what is the process, we said every morning in the morning blessings before the Shema. Creation is not something of the past. Creation is an ongoing process. Every moment he wills existence as if it's the first moment. If he should cease willing existence for a moment, the word goes back to pre-existence. So how do we know? There are allusions in the Torah to resurrection. If a Jew does not believe in resurrection, it's a breach, it's a failing in his belief in God, because this goes into reward and punishment as we explained. So if you understand the process and God said, I will resurrect the dead, of course he'll do it. Because every moment is basically the equivalent of resurrection. Because they say, if he would not will that your soul and your body should exist continuously every moment, it would not exist. It's not, it would, you would die. It would be pre-existence. It's ex nihilo, nothing. There's not a trace. No concept of the vacuum doesn't exist. Therefore, he fulfills his faithful promise to those who sleep in the earth. But to bring that about, who is the equivalent of you? The one of powers, gvuros, gvuros, strength, power. That we find when Moshe supplicated the Jews a number of times in the desert, where the prosecution was overwhelmingly against us. Moshe says to Hashem, you know, when you have a king, although he's the sole authority, but he has advisors and he has to maintain a certain persona with them, a certain goodwill. And he has to come across that he is an equitable king, a fair king. And what happens if his advisors tell him that this person should be put to death? He doesn't deserve to continue. Very often the king, due to those who surround him and are crucial to his power, he succumbs to their, to their position. He has no choice. God succumbs to nobody. God is the sole power. Everything exists around him, although he created a, 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 a legal system within the spiritual realm. There are advocates, there are prosecutors, Satan is the ultimate prosecuting Jewish people, but ultimately nobody tells God what to do. God is all powerful. Who is similar to you? The one who possesses power, powers, not gvura, gvuros, multiple powers. That's power. To be able to resurrect the dead when there's every reason why the person doesn't deserve to be resurrected. And we said, it goes beyond mercy. So after articulating what God is and what he does to bring about the objective and he doesn't leave a stone unturned and he allows every bit of mercy or even beyond mercy, because otherwise existence couldn't continue. So who's comparable to you? We're saying two things. Who is like you? But there's not only, there's nobody like you, nobody has a semblance of you. We're redefining it. There's nobody as great as you. But you know something? There's somebody maybe inching up not far from you, as a semblance of you. Who's even comparable? There's nobody has a semblance of the power of God. Nobody. The greatest angel, which the Talmud describes what an angel is, within human terms, which is really not the reality, because it's only giving us the ability to visualize what that is. But in the spiritual realm, it's, it's beyond any person's, you cannot comprehend or fathom what that is, whatever that is, even that angel, it's nothing. Doesn't have a semblance of what God is. 
God is infinite. Everything's finite. We can't even, we can't, as I said many years ago, when they first sent up the Hubble telescope and the first pictures that came back was six million miles, uh, one million miles of space dust. Could we even visualize what a million miles is? It's something borders on eternity. It's forever. A million miles of space dust. And that's dust. And this is God's creation. You have the galaxies. You have space. And it means nothing to God. He created this. Could anybody have a semblance of what this is? Who is like you, God, all-powerful? You suppress every level of prosecution and you avail every amenity to be able to come to the goalpost. Rahmim Rabim. He don't look. There's nobody even has a semblance to who you are. And who is that? Who are you? Melech may miss. You a king that takes life. King. And you bring, you give life. You take life and you give life. And you cause the salvation ultimately to blossom. It doesn't happen in a moment. You know, it's interesting. You see a puddle of water. It could be two feet deep. And it's a hot day and the sun is shining. And in the morning you have the puddle. Towards dawn, towards sundown, there's barely any water left. Did you see the water evaporate? But that process of evaporation with the sun shining, that water gradually, in a certain unnoticeable way, just evaporated and disappeared. Factually, there's Matzvi's Matzvi Kishur. Every from the first moment of existence, he knows exactly when the salvation is going to come, when the end is going to come, when the Sheikh is going to come, when the world will achieve its level that there are no more challenges. Once Mashiach comes, the evil inclination will be expunged from this existence. All evil will be purged from this existence. But what's happening now is a precursor to that moment. So it's Matzmiach. He plants the Yeshua, the ultimate salvation. All the events we're experiencing now, what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine, the pandemic, inflation. The Gemara tells us that the Sheikh will come in the, seven, in the sabbatical year, which this year is a sabbatical year. There'll be rampant inflation. There's going to be a level of disrespect, which initially was valued. No morals, no values. There's a famous word from Rishon Salanter. It says, the leaders of the generations, their faces will be like dogs. What does that mean? So, you know, today, at one time, a leash, a person had a dog, he had a leash. Kept the dog on a leash. How long was the leash? Three feet, four feet, five feet. Couldn't be too long. Today, you have leashes. It go out 50, 50 yards. And it's in that little box. And the moment the master wants that dog to stop, he presses that button, the dog is, can't go beyond that point. He stops in its tracks. And the dog understands that the master, when it has that leash, it has control over the dog. If you look at the master, the owner of the dog and the dog's way out there, you'd say, you know, the dog is leading the master. Because it's way out there. And the master's following the dog. That every once in a while, the dog looks behind to see where its master is. So how does the dog determine where it goes? Keeps looking back at the master. At the end of time, in the messianic times, what, what's leadership? It's not going to be true leadership. They're going to see in what, what direction is the wind blowing. It's going to be like a weather thing. What did the people want? So it's not true leadership what's in the best interest of the people. These people are not true leaders. They're purely a facade. The faces of the leaders like dogs. That just as the dog looks back to see what the master wants, and that's what he does, identity, the leadership is, what did the people want? 
rather than what's doing the right thing for the people. And that's what it's all about. Ultimately, it's about Tzmich Yeshua. All this, what's happening in this world, the world is tottering. It's literally going off the cliff. And whatever it is, it's always they're pushing the envelope further. You don't, you don't even identify people as gender. There's no such thing. They want to do away with that. Everything is becoming so warped and corrupted and perverted and distorted that you don't know what's day, you don't know what's night. What's good, what's evil. Total confusion. But all that total confusion is just not an it's coincidence. It's not a happenstance. That's part of God's plan before he will reveal what truth is and only then will people appreciate what that is all about. And this is the Matzvich Yeshua. That's he planned this, the salvation and now it's evolving and we're in the process and we're in the literal, the, finest sta- the final stages of the Messianic times, which is called Ikvus and Mashiach, which we're experiencing now. Just to mention something, I read last night, it was something sent out from Chaim Kanevsky. His daughter sent this out, and that Rav Chaim Kanevsky said, and the man, God forbid, is not senile. And he's not uh, hallucinating whatsoever. He said that he had a conversation with Mashiach, Rav Chaim Kanevsky. He said, soon there's going to be a major war, a very serious war. And within up next few months, Mashiach is coming. And therefore, this is what Rav Chaim Kanevsky said. There's going to be a major war, and it's, it's not coincidental. It's not Rechaim Tess who reads the papers and what's going on between the Ukraine and Russia. It's very serious. You can't imagine people in the United States, I don't know. It's like, you know, they have the, they have the heads in the sand, many people. It's very serious, God forbid. And you read a little bit what's going on there. All the governments already advise their people to leave the country immediately. Israel, any Israels, they want them out of there. And I visited Ukraine once. There were 139 Jewish communities in Ukraine. There is a substantial number of Jews in the Ukraine, God forbid. And if there is this battle, God forbid, it could be literally devastating casualties not to be believed. Jews and not Jews alike, not to be believed. It's enough to worry about. But this is what he said. There's going to be a major battle, a major war. And soon after that, it's going to happen. Therefore, people should take an opportunity to upgrade their Judaism, to do tshuva, and try to be as good as you could be. That was the message which he had given over from her father. That's Matzvich Yeshua. So all these things that are happening, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I'm not into speaking politics. Whatever you want to say about the past president, the man was a madman, the man was... What uncouth, whatever you want to say, but the country in terms of its stability, stability, economic stability, our army, many things. Inflation was at a bay, was controlled. And since this new person took over as president of the United States, everything unraveled, it's a disaster. There's no sector of our government of this country which is not a disaster. Everything under the sun. Do you think this is just a happenstance? Why the previous past lost the presidency, this, this person came over. This is all part of God's plan. This is the precursor to the coming of Mashiach, and that's the Matzmiach Yeshua. He's planted the salvation ultimately, and many things have to happen, and this is part of the process to merit the ultimate redemption.